Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 224. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. Between writing notes, filing insurance claims, and scheduling with clients, it can be hard to stay organized. That's why I recommend Therapy Notes. Their easy-to-use platform lets you manage your practice securely and efficiently. Visit therapynotes.com to get two free months of Therapy Notes today. Just use the promo code THERAPYCHAT when you sign up for a free trial at therapynotes.com. Thanks also to DoxyMe for sponsoring this episode. DoxyMe is an easy-to-use, HIPAA-compliant telehealth platform that is available in free and paid versions. Get $50 off a paid account by going to doxy.me and putting in the code THERAPYCHAT. Hey, everybody. Just wanted to give you a little disclaimer about this episode I talked to my guest. We were both in our homes. There was background noise in both of our homes. Uh, You could hear some people kind of talking in the background at his home. And my home, you could hear birds chirping and probably people mowing their lawns and stuff like that. So I hope you can understand, you know, this is kind of an unusual circumstance. I mean, I always do these interviews from my home anyway, but... I wanted to give this out to you quickly. So we tried to do the best we can to make the sound up to the usual standards within limitations of what's possible. So I hope you'll enjoy this conversation between myself and Dr. Brandon Welch, who is going to talk to us about how technology can help therapists and clients weather the coronavirus and in everyday life when things do return to normal. I'm sure that our normal will be different after this because this has been a historic pandemic. But assuming that we all are able to return to working in our offices when we want to, and those who want to continue using telehealth and using technology for the benefit of everyone, I think you'll probably be pretty interested in what Brandon shares. Thanks so much for your support of Therapy Chat as always. Hope you all are staying safe and well. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today I am bringing you another episode focused on coping and managing during this coronavirus outbreak that is affecting us all over the world. And I am going to be bringing you a conversation with Dr. Brandon Welch. Brandon, thank you so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be invited to to chat about some of the stuff I'm doing. Yeah. So Brandon, let's just start off by you telling our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do. Great. So um, I am a professor at the Medical University of South Carolina in beautiful Charleston, South Carolina. I, I work in biomedical informatics, which just means I build software for doctors and patients to use to solve problems in healthcare. And uh, my, my background is actually in genetics. Uh, so I, I have a master's degree in human genetics and I've always been interested in the healthcare space and genetics is difficult uh, for a lot of providers to use. And so I got into informatics and health IT as a way to help doctors manage and use genetics. And so I did my master's degree in human genetics at Tulane University, and then I did my PhD in biomedical informatics at the University of Utah. And so I got this clinical training, but I've also got uh, this technical training, and I combine both the clinical and the technical together to build software that doctors use. And so I understand the clinical side of things, but I also understand the technical side of things. And so combining that knowledge, um, I'm able to develop things that um, can, can solve healthcare problems. And so, and I'm a big usability guy. So uh, a lot of problems with uh, health IT 
in with patients and providers really revolves around like usability. You know, things are difficult to use. It's overly complicated. And so uh, a lot of times it's, it's not about building some new magical software that solves something. It's really about taking what's out there and just making it easier to use more user friendly. And so I found, I found that uh, I'm, most effective by looking at the current technologies that are out there and figuring out how we can make this better, easier, simpler for patients and providers. And so I spent a lot of time building software that there's probably already stuff out there, but I figure out ways to make it easier and more simple. Uh, and so I, so in my role at MUSC, I, I write grants and I write papers. Uh, and I've got, I've, I've received several uh, grants from the NIH to uh, build certain technologies and do certain things. And I have a, a couple of PhD students and I, I write papers on these different technologies that I work in. My, my, most of the time I spend working on projects related to genetics and family history. So I'm collecting family history information uh, from patients to figure out what diseases they're at risk for. And so this is actually in the cancer space. But uh, I also spend a fair amount of time working in telemedicine uh, as also with folks in mental and behavioral health as well. So building software for um, therapists that they use. Uh, and it's largely related to a lot of the telemedicine stuff, but a lot of the tech that I've been building ha- can be immediately adopted by mental and behavioral health uh, therapists. And so I spend, I, I don't have like clinical training in that, but through my experience in working with them, I've learned a lot about what, what therapists need, what the patients who are receiving therapy need. And then I focus on building the tech that uh, can help them get the care that they need. Wonderful. Well, you clearly are a very busy person and I'm grateful that you <laughs> took the time to talk with me today. And you are one of the many hats that you just described is that you're the founder of DoxyMe, which is the mm-hmm. one of our new sponsors on the podcast. I'm very grateful for that. And yep. that is the platform that I've been using since switching to telehealth and my whole staff is using. But, you know, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is that for many clients and many therapists, not just in my practice, but what I'm hearing, you know, around the country, people I talk to, it's very scary to make a switch to telehealth. You know, the therapists are concerned about it. It won't be the same or they can't deal with the technology and the clients are not sure if they're comfortable or if they feel, you know, that they can do that. You know, many people have said they would prefer to just wait until we can meet in person again. And then as this is drawn out longer, you know, we initially planned to close for two weeks and just do telehealth. And then, you know, we've extended it for another four weeks and we don't know past that it may go longer. So, you know, but people who were already needing support and assistance with their mental health now have a new layer of concerns that they're dealing with. So it's, doesn't seem like the right time to just stop doing therapy, but I'm wondering if you can talk about kind of, you know, I guess first, like, what are some of the benefits of using telemedicine just in general and then during a time like this? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And, um, you know, before this coronavirus uh, outbreak, telemedicine has been growing. Uh, And so it's telemedicine, telemedicine isn't anything new. It's been around since the early 2000s. Uh, what's different is that the technology available is has become a lot easier, better, cheaper, faster, uh, and more efficient. And so, and so more people are able to do it. When uh, I started Doxme seven years ago, I was at, I was just a PhD student at the University of Utah, oh my uh, and. And we were looking for a simple way for doctors to meet with patients. And, and this is in for uh, prenatal care. You know, if you've ever had a child, you go in for 15 prenatal care visits. And a lot of times you just go in and you say, how are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Okay, see you again in two weeks. But, I mean, look at the impact it had on the patient where they have to take an afternoon off of work, drive in, park, walk into the clinic, get weighed and talk to the doctor. And then, okay, see you again in two weeks. Like, that's a major impact in somebody's life. And for something, if it's a low-risk pregnancy, is it really, does that amount of care really necessary? And so, we, we were looking at ways to make care more efficient. Uh, and we decided, this is my first introduction to really telemedicine, was that, um, was well, why don't we just do some, some of these prenatal care 
calls by video instead of in person. And as a technology person on the team, they said, all right, Brandon, you go figure out what technology to use. And at that time, Polycom and Cisco were the big telemedicine players, but it required this large hardware installation and complicated technology and the software licenses that were $10,000. I'm Very like, expensive. this is way too expensive. It was cost prohibitive. You had to have a tech team come and set it up. And it's just, yes, it was possible, but it was just not practical for most, for most providers. Uh, and then I'm like, well, look, I'm just going to use FaceTime or Skype because everybody's got a phone and it's easy. People are doing it. They get it. That's the easy thing for patients to do. But the hospital said, no, 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 you can't use FaceTime because it's not HIPAA compliant. Yes. And so I'm like, oh, so where's the simple and free telemedicine solution out there? It's got to be simple and free like Skype or FaceTime, but it's got to be HIPAA compliant. And I Googled it and there's nothing that came up. I'm like, this is nuts. I can't believe that there isn't something out there. And so as a student, I got an, a friend of mine. And we just hacked together a, a, a site really quick. We submitted it to this business idea competition or a, a healthcare innovation competition at the university. And we actually won the Consumer's Choice Award and we got $3,000 to as an award. And we're like, oh, this is awesome. Like, and so we just kept building and adding to it as, as a student. I was doing my PhD and just kind of doing this on the side. And that, that was kind of the, the birth of Doxy, no pun intended, because it's for a prenatal care uh, study. But that's how it started. And we kept building on it and we, we used it in the study and the providers like, oh, this is so awesome. And the patients loved it. And it was great. And we kept getting their feedback and kept building it. And so that by the time I graduated, we had a good enough product. And we said, you know what? The world needs a simple and free telemedicine solution. So we just rolled it out and said, hey, see what happens. Let's go. And and so we've, we've been doing this for several years. And yeah, in the early stage, in the early time, the barrier was the cost and complexity. You know, it wasn't cost effective to spend $10,000 on this hardware. And it was just the only people who could afford it were really the hospitals. So now we came in with this low cost, simple technology that anybody can use. And there are some other software vendors out there that, but it's still pretty early in the game. And they were, they were using a flash as a video and it, some wasn't as good. And um, there's different ways of doing it, but there are other products that started coming out as well. As the technology became more available, other people came came out and so what, what we've seen in the market is over the past seven six seven years is that the cost of complexity has dropped so to make it affordable for anybody to use and so we provide a free product you can't get much cheaper than that and and so that the initial barrier the hesitation was the cost of complexity that's not there anymore so what is keeping people now from adopting it and and it's really goes back to what you what your question was was like uh you know do I really want to change my practice? So I really want to, you know, try something new. And, you know, clinicians have been practicing this way, just the standard way of doing it with patient comes to them for years. And that's just, the, that's just how it's done. And change is hard. It's not easy. It's not comfortable. We're cut. We're very, it's, we're in our comfort zone, especially when you're talking about therapy and patients who have gone through traumatic experiences, shifting to a different way of practice is can also be traumatic, right? And and so you want to, you want to establish that comfort, and and so so we 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 recognize that. And our our driving mantra when we're talking to providers who are concerned about this is to say, look, we're not asking you to change your practice. We're not asking you to go move everybody from in person to all remote, all telehealth. What we say is like. For in-person, there's an appropriate use for people who need to come in person. But there's also going to be use cases where the patient just can't make it in or they're not getting care because they can't come in. And in those cases, this is where telehealth shines. And so Doxyme and telehealth is not there to replace your current way of practicing. It's there to augment it, to give you an additional tool in your quiver to go and to provide care to these patients. At the end of the day, we want to provide care to these patients who need it. If they can come in person and get in person, that's where they feel comfortable, then do that. That's the most important thing. But if there are patients who can't get a ride in, or we've, we we know of cases where patients have moved out of town, or they go to college, and they're not gonna they're not comfortable going to see somebody new. They want to see their therapist that they've known for years. How are you going to do that? You can't do it in person anymore. That's where using something like Doxamy and telehealth comes in to to help provide the continuity of care for those patients, then guess what? The therapist gets to keep that patient, even if they move. So if there's changes in life, they don't lose a patient. They get to keep them. And that's what, that's what, that's where we've seen people come and embrace telehealth is when there's changes and it allows them to continue care. People aren't going out and saying, how can I do something different in my life and cause change? They want to keep the status quo, but sometimes life forces them to change. And traditionally it was people moving out of town or the therapist moving and they want to keep their patients 
that they had their clientele uh, after they've moved. And so that was situations like that, that, that brought people to telemedicine, brought people to doxomy. Now with this coronavirus, that just blew up everything. And, and now you can't come in person, but people still need care. And fortunately, the technology has, is there and it's ready to embrace this time of change where everybody has to embrace telemedicine. And so in, in technology, in the, in the adoption of technology, there's this technology adoption curve where it's the, the first people adopted are the, the, uh, the innovators and the early adopters, and it, it slowly ramps up over time. And then what, what happens is that you, you move from the, the early adopters into a, into a phase called the early majority, where this is the large number of people are coming, they're starting to adapt it. Telemedicine was kind of right on that verge of shifting from the, the early adopters into the early majority. Uh, and in some areas like therapy and uh, counseling, it was starting to make that shift. Other areas like primary care, pediatrics, some of the more traditional, they were still way behind. So therapists were already leading the charge. Therapists were, are, are built for telemedicine because you don't always need to touch and feel the patient where things like pediatrics and primary care, you do, you have to draw blood and do things. And so they were, they were further behind. What we've seen though, is that this coronavirus just shifted the whole technology adoption curve all the way to the right overnight. And so now we're getting people who would probably come in the late majority or the, the after the, the hump to the late majority and even the laggards they're starting to come and embrace telemedicine and it, it just happened overnight. And so, and so we're, we're seeing people who often come to us just dazed and confused, like, Oh my gosh, I have to do something. And I've never thought about this before today. And, and so um, having to make the change quick, having to make it quick and, and because they still have patients that need to be seen and, and patients even, yeah, like, yeah, this is a change. I just want to come in person. That's the easiest thing to do. And, but what we're also finding is that patients once it's kind of like jumping in a cold pond, like you don't want to do it. It's cold. It's uncomfortable. But once you do it and you're, you swim for a few minutes, it's actually not that bad. And actually it's kind of nice. And what we're finding is that patients are starting to respond back and said, Hey, you know what? Can we do this after this coronavirus? Because this is super easy. I don't have to get up and drive anywhere. I can stay in my pajamas and meet with you. And uh, this is awesome. So let's keep doing it. And so what we expect is that you know, initially we're like, you know what, people are just going to sign up for Doxomy and they're using it for during the coronavirus and then they probably leave. And we're happy with that. We're happy to be a provider for telehealth. But what we're finding is that as people get used to it and comfortable with it and, and get used to it, key thing is that they're like, hey, you know, we're com- this isn't as scary as we once thought. We've done it. It's forced us into it. And you know what, let's just hang around and keep doing this because it isn't hard, it isn't complicated, it isn't expensive, and it's more convenient. This is this is great. And so we expect this coronavirus is going to radically shift how medicine is provided in the United States. And it, it's happened overnight, fortunate for us, but also it's fortunate for the provider and the patient because it's going to make healthcare more accessible. It's going to be like more uh, easy to, to deliver. And at the end of the day, it's going to be ultimately a good thing uh, because telemedicine is good. It is should be effective. It does increase care. It is as good as in-person care. Uh, it's just that the, the fear of the unknown is the, the cold water pond syndrome is what kept a lot of people from jumping in. But coronavirus just essentially pushed everybody off the dock and everybody's in the pond swimming and hopefully having a great time now. <laughs> Yeah, I've definitely had a few clients who at the very first time we did it, were like, can we do this every week? I, I, if I thought this was an option, I would have asked for, you know, I'd prefer to meet this way. And I was like, uh, well, you know, let's kind of see what happens. That's yeah. how I feel. But you know, I was like, maybe I, I was more resistant to it before, even though I did use telehealth occasionally, like on snow days or if mm-hmm. someone was sick and they couldn't come in, but they still needed support that day. But, you know, yes, of course, you get more comfortable with it once you practice. Yeah. And ultimately, the patient is the customer, right? And you're going to do what the customer asks. And, and as cus- and the big thing is clinically. Uh, uh, right. Uh, uh, I, sure. Yeah. But um, I think in many cases, customers are going to start out and they're like, hey, we can do this. I'm cool with it. And yeah. it's more convenient. And I think it, that's what, the, as a patient, to ask for it more. We've, we've seen that patients are more open to it than providers are before this happened we patients be like you know sometimes you ask patients like oh, i don't know but you know we've seen providers be the ones who are more resistant to it but i, I think this is forcing everybody in and, and everybody's gonna realize it's hey this is actually a good thing and um, it's making care more accessible 
Yeah. And you brought up a few points that I wanted to mention something about. One is, you know, saying that you started with perinatal work, physical health, but perinatal mental health is much more easily accessible if you use telehealth because, you know, so often for someone who's pregnant or has another young child at home and they may not have childcare to come, to, if they're having perinatal mental health issues and they really need the support, but then they have to bring the younger child with them or, or the older child. Mm -hmm. Or once they have the baby, they bring the baby along, which is fine, but it might not be very convenient or comfortable for the client, for the, for the therapist. It's like, yeah, sure. Bring the baby. It's fine. You know, we just want you to get the support, but for the, the parent, they may like to actually have some space where it can just be for them, you know, and not have to, pack the baby up, change the diaper, blah, 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 do all that stuff. And then the other piece, oh, I'm sorry, you want to say something about that? Well, I was going to say that when we did that study, it was, we focused first on, on low-risk moms and we defined low-risk mom as someone who already had a pregnancy that didn't have any complications, which by definition meant they all had kids at home and were pregnant again. And so we wanted to make it easy. We were like, these moms have to pack up their kids or take them to daycare. And, and it, it, that, that just packing up a kid, taking them to daycare as a mom, that could be a huge insurmountable task, right? And that's preventing them from getting the care that they need, especially mental health, right? Especially postpartum. And why are we making it more difficult? It's already difficult enough suffering through depression and anxiety. Why are we making it more difficult that they have to slug the kid around and drive somewhere to get the care they need? Let's go to them. And, you know, back in the day, doctors used to make house calls. They came to you. Now we just sh- we shifted it in the past 50 to 100 years where we said, no, patients, you come to us. It's the whole hospital complex. And so this is telemedicine is bringing the house call back. It's we're coming to you. We're going to care for you. And telemedicine just makes that access to care much more uh, convenient for these individuals who may have difficult access, difficult time accessing it. Let's just pause for a moment so I can give you a little bit more information about why I love therapy notes. I switched to therapy notes a few years ago. I'd say it's about three years now, I believe. And I have never regretted it. I was very happy with the EHR I used before, but therapy notes is more intuitive. I love the interface. The customer service is fantastic. And I love how I can get my notes done quickly because I can customize the template that I use for my notes and there are opportunities to put check marks rather than having to write out the intervention used. So I have cut my time spent writing notes way down, which is wonderful because I like to focus on seeing clients. I know documentation is an important part of our work, but it can also be time consuming and that is why I love using therapy notes. If you are considering switching EHRs or you're looking for one to use in your practice, give therapy notes a try. You can get two free months by using the code therapy chat. Now let's get back to our interview. Yeah. And so that brings up another piece that we didn't really talk about, but I feel like it needs to be named is that for people who have accessibility issues in terms of like income, transportation, you know, it's someone who it's harder for them to get to a doctor's appointment because of barriers, you know, like Mm -hmm. having to use public transportation and you take two buses across town and then the second bus is late and you end up 15 minutes late for your appointment and then you can't be seen or something. Right. So that, that goes away. And that's something that, you know, I think maybe makes it a little bit more of a, just, I guess, eliminating some of the barriers. Right. Um, But another thing that comes to mind for me, and I don't know if I'm kind of jumping ahead of where we want to go, but I'm just thinking as you were talking about it's impossible to ignore during this coronavirus outbreak that in addition to all the people who are sick with coronavirus, there are the providers who are taking care of them in the hospital and in the doctor's offices and, you know, doctors, nurses and other people involved in their care. If a lot of those things could be done a lot of those types of visits could be done by telehealth that protects the doctors. And I have, yeah. 
uh, two family members who one is a doctor and one is a nurse. They're married to each other. And during this, I've been very concerned, especially about the doctor who was continuing to meet with patients in person because in his mind, there wasn't another option. But I told mm-hmm. him, hey, why can't you do what I'm doing? Yeah, there's there's actually a, um, a clinic out in California. It's not a clinic. I'm sorry, a hospital. I don't know if it's, uh, I forget which one it is, but it's actually a large hospital. And what they've done with Doxamy is they, they have a drive up, you drive up in your car, you get tested, and then they have a Doxamy uh, set up on an iPad to connect to the doctors and nurses in the hospital. So the doctors and nurses don't need to be out there being exposed to these germs. They can do yeah. it all virtually and, and do, do the testing and they just to put it in. And, and so they're able to talk and they're able to do the assessment without being physically exposed. And they're using Doxme to do that. And so, so it is Doxme, you're able to continue care, the telemedicine, just in general, you can continue the care, providing care, uh, but reduce the amount of exposure. So uh, social distancing is accomplished through video. Yeah. So what would you say to clients who are hesitant about using telemedicine right now? Do you have any suggestions for them of how to overcome those concerns? Yeah, I mean, that's our only option right now. So it's kind of like you have to. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, I think, again, people are people talk on FaceTime and they, they use Skype and they, they talk to their family members. And so, I mean, it's just, it's not like a, a new foreign concept. It's, it's the stuff they do already. Um, and it's just making it um, accessible to, to their provider. And so I think if you just, in my experience, I haven't seen too many patients who, are, who would be uncomfortable doing this by video. I mean, they're, they are out there. They're, it's not, it's not bulletproof, but I think if they want to get care, that's kind of what they have to do now, but I would definitely encourage them just try it out and um you know some people we found that if you ask patients what they want to do they'll often say oh, i'll just do it by a phone call or just easier whatever they don't want it to do it but we find that we find that if you do a video call and you're able to see the the face and talk and communicate by video and it's not complicated it's not hard you don't have to do the headache of downloading stuff um and it's how easy it is we, we find that patients say, you know what, that wasn't that bad. You know, they, they, they think it's like, oh, it's going to be so complicated. I don't want to do it. But then they're like, oh, you know, it's not that bad. Yeah, I'll keep doing that. So we, we find that if you ask people what they want, they're like, ah, I'm not sure. If you just say we're doing this and they do it, they don't mind coming back. And it, it's become Some sticky. Some people at that like point. doing it in their home. Right, right. And there's also benefits. Space. It's exactly it. There's benefits to doing calls from their home because you can now as a therapist, you, you can look at their messy house and the craziness going around and you'd be like, oh, that's why you're having anxiety. Let's focus on that first. And you don't always get that when the patient is coming to the clinic and it's all sterile. Yeah, that's true. But also like, you know, they have their, they can be in their bed or they can be, Mm -hmm. you know, with um, their pets or that's what I'm definitely seeing. A lot of pets, a lot of cats Mm. on their laps and dogs sitting close by and it's comforting and they don't have that in the, in our office. When someone comes to my office, even though I want it to be a welcoming space, it is my space. Right. Yeah. Well, let's talk in the time we have left, you are doing a lot of other things with how technology can help with healthcare. Can you talk a little bit about some of those other um, things that you do? Yeah, so uh, I've got a couple other products that we're going to be integrating into Doxy over the next, actually, the first couple are going to be integrated this month. Uh, The first one is using chatbots. So I've done a uh, study before where we're trying to collect data from patients around family health history. And we found that using a chat bot. So it's like text messaging, but it's a bot that does it. So you're not talking to a human, but it sound, it feels like you're chatting with a human through a computer and you're just send, sending messages back and forth. We built a, a chat bot platform called DocBot, D-O-K-B-O-T. And what DocBot does is it, it asks questions just like you begin a text message and the patient responds. And and based on the response, DocBot can say, ask another question or send somewhere else and or, or send them information based upon how they respond. And we find that this chat interaction is way better at collecting data than a typical survey or form. So, you know, therapists will use like an intake form. They fill out an intake form and answer the PHQ-9 or the different get seven different uh, assessments and it's usually just a paper form. What we've done is we've, we've built all these into a chatbot assessment. So it's as if 
a therapist is asking these questions uh, and they're responding to them using this chatbot. Uh, and we send the link, we can send the link to their phone and then they start answering the questions on their phone and it collects the data. So we're using chatbots to collect data. So that's the first one. And um, you, the you first, about that? sure, sure. Um, so how, how does a therapist use that? Like if I wanted to, like I wouldn't give a PTSD assessment through something like that because I would want to do it myself because it seems more it's sensitive Mm -hmm. but I don't know like what kind of information would would a therapist just be like before we start our session can you please fill out this you know chat bot yeah I mean you you can do that in patient check-in and you can have like a tablet in their computer and, and they just but really what we're doing is we're just sending the link to the patients and they fill it out so the day of the appointment like hey I'm, I've got a couple questions to see how you're doing today that you send them the text message link they click it and they start the conversation and they and they just kind of the, the bot asks questions about how are they feeling today do you have did you how have you been sleeping and and whatever and we've implemented a lot of standardized assessments that is used in the mental health space it collects the information and then sends the information back to you as a provider so that when, when the patient gets to the appointment you've got the information packaged and say this is what the patient said but we can also send these reminders throughout the week or these, I'm um, sorry, not the reminders, the, the bots to do assessments throughout the week. So if you want to check in on them throughout the week and say, hey, how are you feeling today? We can send these assessments and they fill it out th- during the week and then the data gets sent back to the, the provider to fill out. So that, that's the type of stuff that we're starting to do is it's for data capture, collection of information, doing assessments, pre-appointment, even post-appointment uh, throughout the week uh, between appointments so you can capture data from patients. And we're finding that patients fill out information using bots better than they fill out using a typical surveyor form. And so you get a lot of times you sell these, fill out these forms and they don't collect it completely or they don't fully understand it. And we find that people are patients are more engaged with bots. It's like they're having a conversation with their sister and it's, they find it more fun than just filling out and kind of like plain boring survey. So it's, it's an interesting that finding that we have. And more- so we're building it up. It is more fun. And everybody who uses it is like, Oh, this is fun. You know, it's like, God, this is awesome. Like if we can make collecting data from you fun, we're going to get more data from you. And so uh, for the provider. So, so that's exciting. Um, so that's DocBot. And a lot of these products all interact with each other. So we're going to integrate DocBot into Doximy. In fact, we've already got some DocBot. Uh, so when you, if you're using Doximy and you have a question, you, you chat with our bot to answer questions about like troubleshooting. Uh, and so that's the first introduction of the bot. It's, we call it DoxyBot on Doximy. And so you can chat with a bot and the, the bot will help you figure out what's going on and, and help you troubleshoot it. But we're going to be integrating the bot into the chat. Check-in. So when the patient checks into a Doximy room, right now it's just the, the video, the, the check-in screen comes up and the patient types in their name. And there's a little video screen there. And then they go into the waiting room. But hopefully by the end of the month, it's going to be a bot check-in as an option. So you can do the traditional check-in or a bot check-in. And when the bot checks in, they'll be like, hey, I'm Doxybot. I'm going to help you check in. What's your name? And he said, let's check your audio. Let's check your video. Let's do the different steps. And it'll be like a conversation. And it'll feel like they're checking into a medical, like an office assistant. When when somebody comes to your clinic and you have an assistant there, like, hey, you know, you know how you doing? You're checking in. All right. Just wait here uh, until your, your therapist is ready. Um, that's what the, what it's going to feel like to the patient. It's going to feel like they're interacting with a human, but it's just a bot that's doing this. And so um, that is probably, we have a goal to get the beta version out by the end of this month. And so that's something you can start playing with in Doximy. And, and, but then we also, that will be the start. But then as we start rolling out the assessments that we've built, uh, now you can, the patient will check in. How you doing? Hey, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Smith would like you to fill out this PHQ-9 uh, at the start of the session. So while they're in the waiting room, waiting for the doxy call to start, they could be talking to the bot, filling out their assessment uh, before the call starts. And then when the call starts, we'll have that information already collected that can be displayed to the therapist. And so those type of features we're starting to roll out over the this coming year, the next several months, and they'll make the streamlining of the clinical workflow using technology. And so ultimately it's, we want to make things more efficient and easy for the patients and providers. And this is how we're doing it it's through bots is one way. Interesting. Yes. And then the next one uh, is a, is a newer project that we're working on. It's called Adherely. So it's adhere.ly. Uh, and this is to send out uh, reminders to patients throughout the week to do things. And so uh, I was working with a colleague, who, um, Dr. Brian Bunnell. Uh, he was here at MUSC and I was at the University of South Florida. And he's focused on 
uh, he's a trauma-based uh, therapist as well, focused on using technology to help patients adhere to protocols, treatment protocols. And so, so yeah, a lot of uh, therapists give homework to do during the week. So it could be mindfulness or it could be meditation, uh, muscle relaxation. It, it could also be if you're doing some type of exposure therapy. So to go and do that and then to report how they're feeling throughout the week and then and to come back. And this is homework to do. This is fairly typical for, for therapists to do. But often what happens is that, especially with kids, uh, they come back and they haven't done it yet. And, and so it's like, well, gosh, uh, I need you to do this so we can keep progressing in the in the in in this therapy protocol. Uh, and there, and a lot of kids aren't doing it. So he actually got a grant to look at using health IT to get kids to adhere to these protocols. And so we started working together last summer to build a, a product that uh, reminds kids to uh, not just kids; it's, it's really anybody. His grant is focused on kids, but we've made it broad to remind patients to do things throughout the week. And it's just a simple tool that you, you go in and you say, I'm going to send a simple message to remind my patient to do X. And they type in their, their phone number or an email address and it sends a text message or just a message to say, hey, and you can schedule the time. So Wednesday at 7 p.m., remember to do mindfulness. And it's a text message is sent. So they can schedule a message and it goes out 7 p.m. Hey, Brandon, don't, don't forget to do uh, your mindfulness tonight. And I'm like, okay, great. And so we've, built, we've been building this um, and uh, we've got several activities and several reminders that we've set up already, but we're still you know, adding more things. But um, so a simple, we're going to integrate, start integrating these simple reminders into Doximy as well, so that on your Doximy call, you can remind patients to do something throughout the week. And you can say, all right, remind Brandon to do mindfulness on Wednesday at 7 p.m. And you can schedule that within Doximy now. And this is part of this other product, the Tier that we're starting to integrate within Doximy. So that should be up by the end of the month as well, because we've already got it built and it's just a matter of integration at this point. But uh, so this is, it, it's a way to, to, to remind patients to do things, uh, to adhere to their, to remind patients to, to do activities, to adhere to certain protocols that will help with the therapy. That would be something that I would, I don't know if you were going to do it this way, but I would value that as a standalone thing too, because it is, you know, yeah, good. Yeah. So it's, so all these products are all standalone. So there's Doximy, there's DocBot, and then there's Adherely. And they're all standalone products, but they all can integrate as well. So if you go to uh, adhere.ly, you can see what we um, have built. It's just, a, it's a simple beta version. Uh, it's got simple reminders and activities you can even do there's uh, mindfulness videos in there you can do with a patient in session and then send send out and it's free to use uh everything we do is there's always a free version that that uh providers can use uh and we this is still pretty early because it's it's funded through nih at this point and so we don't really charge people for using it and uh and we've got several more years on that grant that so we're just going to keep building stuff and what we what we want is we want providers to use it and provide feedback like hey this is awesome can you add this can you do this because that gives us the direction that we need to to build what you guys care about that's how how we did it with doxme uh that's how we're doing it with docbot and adherently and so we we love feedback and we'd love people to use it try it out and give feedback that's why we make it free so people can use it and and give us that feedback so we can make it better well we are running out of time, but I really want to tell you from the heart how grateful I am that you, that Doxy Me is out there for all the work you're doing. But, you know, when everybody was making this shift a couple weeks ago and it was a crazy time um, and I'm in a lot of therapist groups and people were saying, Doxy Me, oh my gosh, there was one day where they said, slow today. And, you know, someone else said, look, they've been adding like 2,500 new customers per hour. And I mean, I'm just so grateful that you could keep up with that because I, later that day, everything was running smooth as could be. I didn't have any problems personally that day, but you know, a couple of people said they didn't. I was like, gosh, you can understand why. And so the way you were all able to really, you know, overuse word, but pivot just, I mean, I guess it's not really a pivot for you. For us, it was a pivot for you. It's just like adding capacity, but yeah, no, it was, um, it's been a crazy couple of weeks. I appreciate that. Um, it, we, we were going from adding about 100 to 120 providers per day. And, and at our peak, we added 32,000 providers a day. Uh, and for about two weeks, it's about 25, 
to 30,000 providers. It was nuts. And, and we, many we, systems would completely crash under that. And the fact that right, it didn't right. just says yeah. something. And and when we, there was a, a few hours in the past, in those two weeks where the total, a couple hours total, like so that we were maybe, and, and what happened was like, we had a server capacity and the servers never crashed. Never at any time did the servers crash. What happened was that there were so many people coming into the site that the server, it, people started queuing up to get onto the server. That's how, that's how, so when people saw blank pages for a few minutes is because there was a school bus and there was 150 people trying to get on a school bus that can only hold 50, right? So people are still getting on. And, and so, but as we saw, I mean, we, we saw this volume starting to pick up and we were just adding servers to stay ahead of it. But Mondays, that one Monday, it was crazy. That's where we had 32,000 signups and, yeah. and it was just, but we, we just, our team wrecked quickly to, to add server capacity and now we we've got way more than we need because we just kind of just kept doubling our server capacity to just stay way ahead of it and we're making optimizations and tweaks to to but I, i'm really impressed with not only our team and handling this volume we, sh- we shifted a lot of people we brought in we, we had a team about 15 and now we're up to about 50 and we've brought people in really quick to to provide support to answer customer questions to to feel those things and and the team has been able to adapt really well marvelously the tech has been able to, to handle the, the growth. Uh, and so we've been really pleased with how things have gone given the situation. I mean, it's not every, you don't prepare for something like this. Um, and we really got, uh, everybody got punched in the face. Every telemedicine product out there got punched in the face. And I'm really impressed with our, the team and the tech and being able to handle it the way we have. And, and but ultimately it's, it's for you guys, right? We want, we want to help you provide care to patients. And we're, we're really honored that, that we can be here to help you. The, the true heroes are the providers during this time, reaching out to the patients. And we're just honored that we can be the, the, the sword that they're using to go and, and um, you know, provide care and, and, and to help pay patients. And so, and so, uh, so we're thrilled. We'd love uh, people to keep using us and to, to share it with their colleagues and, and pr- provide feedback and help us, uh, help us get better and add features that will be useful and, and uh, uh, really be here as a solution to, to help you embrace telemedicine and, and, and care for patients. Awesome. Well, so for the feedback part, where would you want people to give you feedback? Is it in the, so uh, we have a, yeah, there's a, if you log into the dashboard, there's a, a community forum, a discussion forum, okay. and that's where a good place to go. And, and we have a section in there where it's uh, product improvements or ideas or uh, so you can post ideas there. And, and we're we're watching that. You can always always email us or through a, the, the help pages and just con- or the help. Uh, we have a little help button. You can talk to the bot or if you want to you know, send us like, Hey, I think it'd be great to do this, but really the discussion forum is the best place. Cause then you can post something then other therapists would be like, Oh yeah, that's a great idea. And this is how I would use it. And so we, uh, that's the best way because we get multiple providers kind of saying, yes, I vote this up. This is a great idea. Great. That's awesome. Well, Brandon, thank you so much for taking the time to come to therapy chat today. I I'm very grateful for everything you've been doing and for the time you shared today. Cool. Thank you. I loved it. It's very enjoyable. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. There are many ways to keep your practice organized, but Therapy Notes is the best. Their easy-to-use, secure platform lets you not only do your billing, scheduling, and progress notes, but also create a client portal to share documents and request signatures. Plus, they offer amazing unlimited phone support, so when you have a question, you can get help fast. To get started with the practice management software trusted by over 60,000 professionals, Go to therapynotes.com and start a free trial today. If you enter promo code therapy chat, they will give you two months to try it out for free. Thanks also to DoxyMe for sponsoring this episode. DoxyMe is an easy to use HIPAA compliant telehealth platform that is available in free and paid versions. Get $50 off a paid account by going to doxy.me and putting in the code therapy chat. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.